space, the ultimate frontier, and a source of personal confusion of mine. Hi, my name is Amedeo Beretta, and in this video I'm going to explain you the very basics of how space works in a 3D software, and why understanding it will not only speed up your animation workflow, but also improve the quality of your professional life. This video will be the base for the next one, in which I will explain a technique that is often referred to in the jargon as space switching. I believe understanding 3D space gives animators a much greater deal of confidence while animating, and when I look back at the time when I first started animating professionally, I actually find it quite embarrassing how little did I know about 3D space and how many days of fruitless work this ignorance has cost me. The bottom line here is that understanding and taking advantage of the features of 3D space allows you to easily keep control over less than trivial animation. So let's switch to our visual aid. Now that car is unwanted parcels paid for by someone who didn't need them and delivered to someone who doesn't want them, the drone. Now this vehicle is at the center of the grid and in fact if you check the translate values they are 0, 0, 0. When the vehicle moves forward then the value changes on the translate Z and increases in value. The moment the plane lifts up vertically that's when you see the translate Y increasing as well because the plane is flying parallel to the Y axis. To make it clearer you can imagine that the yellow sphere is the center of the grid and whenever the plane moves around there is an axis that stands in one direction, if the plane moves up the axis extends up and if the plane moves to the side then the axis extends to the side and when you grab the controller you will find the respective values in the channel box. These values are in normal conditions relative to the grid. However let's imagine for a second that the plane itself was a child to the yellow sphere and that yellow sphere is the origin. As I move the origin around you see that the position of the plane changes in space and if I rotate the origin you see that the position of the plane adapts itself. However when I select the plane controller you see that there is no rotation whatsoever on the controller and also the values in the translate are not even changing. As the origin translates around the child itself is not aware of any change and in fact the translate values don't change because the plane, the child of this hierarchy, uses its parent as a point of reference as you do normally so that this sphere you're seeing represents the group containing the plane and when the group moves around the plane doesn't really know it's being moved around because the plane being a child of the origin group as far as the plane is concerned if the two are aligned and they are the plane is at zero. The same way a kid would typically consider their family the origin of their life, the zero, the starting point. If a kid is at home and you ask them where they are, they will probably answer they are at home. They won't tell you the country they find them in. And the same goes for this plane. If you have any object into a group or under another object, the child will always move relative to the parent, whatever you do, to the point in which you can actually use this to your advantage. So for instance, if we wanted the plane to perform a loop, the cheapest way would be to select the master control, move it down away from the origin, then grab the origin and rotate the origin with just two keys we get the animation of the loop. This is very handy in a number of situations and it's very roughly speaking the equivalent of the 3D pivot in Blender. Similarly if you wanted your character to spin around this pole you would have several choices but with the default settings you would have a master down there on the feet so you would be essentially forced to move the master and every time counter rotate it. Or if you were a bit more technically advanced, you could constrain the master to the pole. Another thing that you could certainly do would be to take advantage of the two master system that you find in many rigs, snap the main master up to the pole, and then grab the secondary master and move it down by the same amount you move the main one up. This way you created an additional pivot for your rig. In fact, you see, I now have exactly the same situation I had earlier on with the plane. Of course you would want your primary master pivot to be right at the center of the pole which would mean positioning the hands controller in a slightly different way in this case. 
Now, by grabbing the master that I moved up, I find myself exactly in the same position I was when I was doing the loop with the plane, with the only difference that instead of having the yellow sphere as the main parent of the hierarchy, I actually have the usual mega master there. And I can rotate the mega master any way I like it. And thanks to the way I understand hierarchies and 3D space, I can solve this animation with only two keys and everything else becomes immensely easier. To the point in which if I wanted to delay, say, the left foot in here, I could just build a locator, this one, that moves exactly like the foot. I could constrain the foot to it so that whenever I move the locator, the foot moves. And then I could delay the animation of the locator by, say, three frames. And now you see that the foot is delayed if compared to the master. And this without having to do any fancy animation of if you are into animation, you can easily understand the potential of this technique. Of course, I would use automatic tools to do this thing. There is another interesting factor to consider, which is scale. Let's say that we move the plane around within its space. We move the origin group around. So now the plane thinks it's moved by a certain amount of units from the yellow sphere, the origin, not from the origin of the grid. And that's because the plane is the child of the grid. Now, if you grab your reference space and you scale it, you're not only scaling the object within, but you see that you're also scaling the units. Now your Cartesian diagram is stretched in one direction. And if you are stretching the coordinate system, you are also affecting rotations because objects will become longer the more they get parallel to the long axis. And that's why when you parent anything to anything else, you usually want to freeze at least the scale of the parent, unless of course you're doing something particular that you know about. So we have seen that if an object is contained into a group, when you zero out the translation and rotation of the object, the object will line up with the center of the group and not to the center of the grid. We have seen that if you grab a group containing an object and you scale it in a non-proportional way, you're going to stretch not only the object, but also the measurement system, which means that if you type the same amount of units on one axis and on another, you won't get the same amount of translation, you see, because one axis is scaled longer than another. Especially at the beginning when you operate a 3D software, I think it's important to understand the way space is managed within the software. And that I know of most 3D software manage space in a similar way. Let's say that in this scene, there are two planes. On the left, you have the one which is under its own personal origin, under a group which contains a yellow sphere as well. When you grab the main control is one on the left, as I said, it's zero will always be aligned to the group. The plane on the right instead is free in space. You see the master control is free in space. It moves in world space, we say. If I grab both controllers and zero them out, you will see that the plane which is under the yellow sphere group does not move at all because it's already aligned to its zero point. But the other plane, when it goes to zero, it goes down to the center of the grid. And that's because the master control of the plane which is free in space is in grid space, its parent, it's the grid, while the one under the yellow sphere, it's in the space of this group called the origin. And for as long as they are part of the same hierarchy and you see they are, whenever we input zero in the master control, the plane will go back down to the center of its reference space, which is the sphere or the origin group. It doesn't really make a difference in this case. Things start to get interesting when you want to rotate these planes. I will grab for the plane on the left, just the master control. And for the plane on the right, I will grab the origin group, the one that contains the rig. I will rotate them both. And then I will want to animate the plane flying forward. They fly forward by the same amount at the same speed. However, a quick check at the graph editor will reveal that the plane which is under the origin group has a single curve controlling its forward motion, while the one that is free in space has two curves controlling its motion. And that is because the one on the left, according to its reference space, which is the grid, is moving on one axis when it moves side to side and on one axis when it moves forward. While the one which is under an origin group has its reference space already oriented like the main motion, so when it moves forward, it moves forward on a single axis because relative to its origin, you see, it's going straight in a single direction. 
This is extremely useful because that means that if I had to spline this plane, I would only have to spline a single axis for this motion. Whereas if I spline the plane that lives in world space, I would have to spline and control two curves. That's twice the amount of work, which is going to be multiplied by the number of controls you have in a rig, which means a few hundreds of controls usually. And that's why before you do a very complex piece of animation, you usually plan ahead the technical workflow that you want to employ, because sometimes placing objects in world space will give you twice the amount of work or three times the amount of work or x times the amount of work, while some other times is the act of placing them under an origin group that generates more work. So you have to be able to decide at the beginning of your shot which technique is better and even better to have a workflow that lets you convert between the two options to make the best of both worlds, of course. In fact, the workflow you will decide to follow will have a dramatic impact on the workload you will have during splining. So for instance, if we see this cat in here, whose name, by the way, is Purple from the game River Tales. Actually, you should check it out because the game developers are now on Kickstarter and you can help them out if you like the game. You will find a link to it in the description below. Anyway, Furple the cat is translated forward by a master that moves on a single curve. You see, due to the fact that I have an origin master, I can reroute this whole run in any direction and still have a single curve moving forward. And this curve will always be pointing forward even if I rotate the main masters. This is pretty handy if you compare it to a situation where maybe I am moving the character at an angle but not using the master. With the master without any animation zeroed out at the center of the grid, you will find that the root moves forward. But if we grab the root controller and we check the translation in the graph editor across space, we will find out that the general direction of the character is actually the result of two different curves that if scaled proportionally will let me move the character forward, but if they won't be moved together, they will cause the character to drift around, making it a lot more difficult indeed to control the animation. Another way to look at it is to imagine there is a box and inside the box there is a little mouse trapped in. Now, the mouse doesn't know where it is, it can only see inside the box and the box unfortunately is not transparent. Inside the box there is a camera connected to the box itself, it's glued to it, so whatever happens to the box, the camera does not move relative to it. If I now ask the mouse to tell me where it is, the mouse would say I am at zero, it is at the center of the box, which incidentally is also the center of the grid, you see. And the channel box is telling me that the mouse is at zero indeed. However, if I grab the box and move it forward, you see that the only thing that really changes is that we leave the grid behind. But according to the mouse, nothing has changed whatsoever. If you were to ask the mouse, where do you stand now? The mouse would still answer at zero because as far as you can tell, nothing really changed. And this is exactly how space works. Anything which is a child of something else will always give you in the channel box values that are relative to the parent, not to the grid. I could even rotate the box containing the mouse by 90 degrees, say, and the mouse still wouldn't know anything about the rotation. In fact, you see there is rotation value here changing for the box, but if I select the mouse, there is no rotation going on in there whatsoever. And that's because, remember, the reference point of the mouse at this stage is the box itself. So there are two things to keep in mind. One is that a child will always see their parent as the reference point of their life, their zero, the life, the origin. That is, of course, unless the parent behaves really, really badly, in which case it's another story that usually involves social services. The other thing is that when the child moves, it moves in the space, we say, of its parent, in this case, the box. So as the mouse travels forward in here, you see it travels on a single axis, that is translate Z. And it does so even if at a certain point I decide to rotate the box. I rotate the box and you will find out that the rat is still traveling on a single axis, despite the fact that the box is not only rotating but also translating in space and that the mouse doesn't even translate in an, on a straight line. And that's because the only translation it sees is the one relative to its parent, which can be very useful if you have to animate very complex motion and keep the number of curves you will have to spline to a minimal number. That usually implies less work. If you wanted the character, say this mouse, 
to be at zero in a specific position or space without being a child to something else? You can, you just have to go under modify and freeze, translate and rotate. However, the problem with this is that now you lost the rotation axis. You see they're no longer aligned to the object. Also, you have no immediate way to go back to the center of the grid should you need to, because you're in a situation in which in the jargon, you might hear people saying that you lost world space positioning or global coordinates. So it is usually a good idea to know what you're doing before freezing translation and rotation. Usually these channels are frozen while the character is at the center of the grid, for instance, before it being rigged. But every situation is different. This is not necessarily an issue. It's just a feature you have to be aware of. In fact, the very basics of rigging rely on this feature. If I were to parent the mouse back into the box, zero out the mouse rotation and translation, the two things would be perfectly aligned, you see? And if I move the box around, the channel box of the mouse would not move. They would still be at zero. I don't know if that reminds you anything, but it reminds me of a controller moving around a character for which you know that when you open a rig in Maya, if you grab any control, usually by default and you zero them out, the character goes back to the T pose. That is because in most rigs, the controls are actually not out in world space, but they are part of a hierarchy. So for instance, in this case, I have the head control, which has these values. If I zero them out, the head control doesn't go down at the center of the grid because above the head control, there is a group which is aligned to the control you see. And by moving the group, the control moves, but you move the group and the control is always staying at zero as far as values are concerned. That's usually why when you grab a control of a character that is somewhere arbitrary in space, the control is still at zero. To go back to the mouse example, if I were to build a very basic rig for the mouse, I would build a group containing a control curve and then the geometry could be connected in various ways to this rig. In this case, I'm just going to constrain it to the control curve, which is not really ideal, but we're going to work with it. Now, the beauty of this thing is that if I wanted the typos of the mouse to be somewhere else, not in the center of the grid, I would grab the group and move it wherever I need the mouse to be, say there. And when the animator opens up this rig, they will find the control curve. And the control curve is still at zero because the group that moves the control curve was moved. And this is why the controls that you normally find around are at zero. You can move the control around and if you want that to go back in that arbitrary place in space, you just need to zero it out because that arbitrary place in space is marked by the group itself, which is the parent of the control curve. So the curve will always go back to that place if it's zeroed out. And this is the very basic of rigging really. This is when you start to understand the way space and hierarchies interact in a traditional 3D software. And this is it for now. This is the basis upon which I will build the space switching video for next week. I hope you have found this useful and if that's the case, please consider leaving a comment, liking, subscribing and hitting the notification bell. And if you want to support the channel, I think that of course will let me do more videos. You can follow the link in the description below. Have fun! Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.